Hello everyone and welcome back. In our last section, we saw how to modularize our app with blueprints. This is section 5, Securing the App. In this section, we will cover how to add security measures to your app, like secure logins and registration systems. Also, we will create a permissions-based system to be used with the login system to better define what a user can and cannot do. This is video 1 of section 5. In this video, we will be using the Flask extension Flask Login in order to handle most of the login functionality. So, Flask Login is a Flask extension that is designed to make the login and authentication process a breeze for Flask users. The first step in using a new Flask extension is always installing it. Let's do that now with PIP. After PIP is finished installing Flask Login, we will need to create a new file in our project directory called extensions.py. This file will hold all of the code that initializes the extension objects that we will be creating throughout the course. Now import the Flask Login main object and initialize it. Then, just like the DB object, the Login Manager object needs to be registered on the app with the init app method in underscore init underscore dot py. Flask Login works by storing the ID of the logged in user in a secure cookie on the user's browser. The cookie is created when the user successfully logs in and is destroyed when the user logs out. The browser sends this cookie with every HTTP request, and if the route is marked as requiring a login, the Flask Login will check if the ID is associated with a valid user. In order for this system to work, we need to give Flask Login a couple of things. First, in our extensions.py file, we need a method that allows Flask Login to check if an ID corresponds to a valid user object. This function will take the ID as its only parameter, and if there is a valid user object, return it. If there isn't a valid user object, the function should return none. Thankfully, the get method of the user.query class does this exact thing. All that's left is to decorate the function with Flask Login's decorator at login underscore manager dot user underscore loader. Also, we need to tell Flask Login where our login page is so that it can redirect unauthorized users to it successfully. To do this, just set the login underscore manager dot login underscore view variable to main dot login as we will be creating the login route on the main blueprint. Next, Flask Login needs our user model to inherit another class and to implement two new methods. In the user class, inherit the user mixin class and the anonymous user mixin class from the Flask Login so that Flask Login knows that the user model should act as a representation of a user. Those of you who have come from a language like Java would know the user mixin as fulfilling the role of an interface. Now we need to add the two methods we mentioned earlier. First is the get underscore ID method. This method just returns the primary key of the user's row on the database. Secondly, we have the is underscore active method. The is underscore active method is for having a distinction in your app between users who have registered and users who actually use the site. For example, if you are able to ban users or if users have to confirm their email, you would use this method to stop users from logging in while storing their data. We want to be able to ban users, so let's create a new column on the model called active, which will be a Boolean function, and the function will return this value. Now our user model is ready to be accepted by Flask Login. And that's it for this video. We introduced Flask Login and created the functions and methods it needed to tie into our user system. Awesome! We still need to find a way to handle encrypted passwords, however. We're going to cover this in the next video. In the previous video, we installed and configured Flask Login. In this video, we are going to cover how to handle encrypted passwords. As you may remember from the previous section, our user model is ready to be accepted by Flask Login. But we need a method to check if the string matches an encrypted password and a method to set the encrypted password from a string. But first, for those who don't know, let's go over what password hashing is. A hashing function is a function that allows data of an arbitrary size to be consistently reduced to the same data of a fixed size. What this means is that if you take any binary data, you can pass that data into a hashing function. If any of the data does not change, you will always get the same answer. 
which is usually a string. It's also important to note that it's impossible to retrieve the original information from the result of a hashing function, which is called a hash. Why is this useful? Say we have a large file that contains sensitive information, and you want to make sure that it hasn't been tampered with when you get it on your computer. What the originator of the file can do is send the large file through one of the available hashing functions and send you the result. Now, when you get the file on your computer, you can send the file through the same function, and if both hashes are the same, you know for a fact that the original file and your copy are the same. You will see this very often in open source projects, especially ones that require you to install the admin access. People want to make sure that what they are giving access to their computer is the exact same software that everyone else is using. From this example, you can think of a hash as a signature of the original data. This signature aspect of hashes is why we will be using them to store our passwords. What hashes allow us to do is never store the user's password, but gives us a way of easily determining if a string is the original data for a hash. After we add password hashing, if a malicious user contains the data in the database, all they will get are the hashes, and to log in and steal their identity, the malicious user would have to brute force the password by trying every combination of letters, numbers, and symbols until the hashing algorithm produces a match. Even if you have a weak password, this could take years if the developer chooses a hashing algorithm with the appropriate amount of strength. Thankfully, WorkZoog, the library that Flask uses to handle the WSGI side of the app, has a strong hashing algorithm built in. First, the generate password hash and check password hash functions need to be imported from the WorkZoog security module. Now the two methods are going to be very simple. The setPassword method just sets the value of self-password to the return value of generate password hash, and check password just returns the value of check password hash. Now when a user registers for a new account, the password value will be sent to the set password method, and every time the user logs in, the value of the password field will be sent to the check password method. If the user object is successfully created, then the user is sent to the login page with a message that informs him or her to log in with their new credentials. Okay, we covered a lot of ground in this video. We covered what a hash function was and how it can be used to protect our user information from people who wish to steal it. That's it for this video. In the next video, we will make our new login system accessible to our users by creating login and registration pages and making necessary changes to the back end. In the previous video, we made our App Store password securely. In this video, we are going to make our new login system accessible to users from the front end. We have the login page and the registration page. Each of these pages requires a form object, a template, and a route. So let's create those in that order. In the forms.py, add imports for the necessary fields, and let's start with creating a login form object. The login form will just have two fields, a text field for the username and a password field for the password input. The new feature we will be using for this form is the validate method, which we mentioned in the video when WT Forms was first introduced. The validate method controls how WT Forms determines if the data entered in a form is valid for that form. For the login form, not only do we want the validators on the field objects to be valid, but we also want to check if the data passed refers to a valid user and if the password is correct. First off, because this method is overriding the implementation of validate from the form object, we want to call the form object's validate method using super so it properly handles all of the type and validator functions. Then, we need to query to grab a user based on the username passed. If there is no such user, return false. And if user exists, 
Then use the check password method we created earlier to make sure the password is correct. If everything is fine, return true. Also, we should add error messages to the failures to tell the user why the login failed. Now, when data is sent to this form object, it will handle all of the checking logic, so it doesn't have to be in the route logic. The register form object will be mostly the same as the login form object, except that there is a new field confirm, which must be equal to the password field. Also, we force the username field to be less than 225 characters and the password to be more than 8. In this form's validate method, all we need to check for is if there is another user who already has the desired username. Now we have both of the form objects that will handle the data from the web forms. The next step is to create the login.html and the register.html forms in the main template folder. These pages contain nothing new. They use the same logic as the template we saw for the comments section in the WT Forms video. And now we move on to the register page, which looks very similar as well. Finally, we create the route functions. In the main.py file, we will add the necessary imports, and then we'll add a login route and a registration route. In the login route, an instance of the login form object will be created, and in the validate underscore on underscore submit check, a user object will be queried, and then using the login underscore user function from the Flask login, that user object will be logged in. The user is sent to the home page with a message that tells him or her that they were successfully logged in. Finally, the login route renders the login.html file and sends the form object to the template. The registration route will use much of the same logic as the login route, but instead of logging the user in, a new user object is created and sent to the database. If the user object is successfully created, then the user is sent to the login page with a message that informs him or her to log in with their new credentials. Next, let's use SQLite3 shell to add an active column, since we have it in our user model, but not in the database itself. Finally, let's add a couple of imports that we missed in underscore init underscore dot py and forms dot py files. We can test our login process now. Head to localhost colon 5000 slash register and I'm going to make a new user called John Doe and we will just give him a password of password. If we hit submit, we are successfully taken to the login page And if we enter the credentials we've just created, we successfully log in. OK, we can log in, but how do we make it so a view can only be accessed by logged in users? To illustrate this, I'm going to create a view that just returns some text. At the end of this section, this view will be removed as it's for demonstration purposes only. To keep logged out users out of this view is really simple. Just import the login required function from Flask login and add it to the view as a decorator. That's it. Because we are logged in in our browser, we can access this page. To finish this video, there are some cosmetic and cleanup things that should be done before moving on. First, our user needs a logout view. So using the logout user function from Flask login, let's create this function now. Next, we should add a link on the navigation bar to allow people to go to the login page if they're logged out, as well as a registration link and a logout if they're logged in. We will use the current user proxy that Flask login gives us to achieve this. We will also use isAuthenticated method to check if the current user is logged in. The current user proxy is available in both templates and in the view. Finally, Let's adjust the blog page. Let's change this line to use current user instead of user with ID of 1.
let's make sure that this view can only be used by logged in users. In the post.html, let's wrap the comment form in an if condition. so only logged in users can see it. Let's also make our users active by default by setting self active to true in register route. Time for final testing. So, in this video, we created the login and registration pages with form objects that log in the user, and we learned how to keep logged out users out of a view. That's it for this video. In the next video, we will cover how to add specific permissions to the login system to distinguish between more than logged in and logged out users. This is video 4 of section 5, securing the app titled Adding User Permissions. In this video, we are going to add functionality to our app that allows us to define where each user can and cannot go. Each user will have an assigned role, and each view will define whether or not certain roles are allowed to access the page. All this functionality will be handled through a new Flask extension called Flask Principle. Here's how Flask Principle works. Flask Principle is based around the idea of identity, which is handled by our login system. The identity in Flask Principle is an object that provides information about the user. Specifically, it provides what are called permission objects. Whenever a page is loaded, Flask Principle checks whether or not the identity of the current user provides the permission objects to satisfy the need objects that are needed to access the view. Permission objects and needs objects work in tandem. As we will see when we get to the code, permission objects are actually created from need objects. So what permission objects really do is they tell Flask principle when they're tied to an identity. I provide this need. Identity objects are created whenever we tell Flask principle that the identity has changed. In our app, this would happen whenever user logs in or logs out. So there are a couple of things we need to add to get this working. The first is to notify Flask principle whenever the user logs in or out and build the identity for the user during that process. Secondly, create permission objects. Add permission checks to views. Also, we need to add a role model to the database. The first thing that we will do whenever we use a new Flask extension is to install it. So, headed to the terminal and install Flask principle with pip. Let's start adding to the code by defining the model for our role in the database. The role model will be building off of the knowledge that we already have to create a very familiar looking object. This model will just have a name associated with it, as well as a description field. Because the role will be in a many-to-many -many relationship with the user object, we need to add a secondary table, just like the secondary table for the tag for the relationship to work. And then, finally, add the db.relationship object to our user model. Before we can actually use any of the functionality that we plan to add, we need to add some rules into the database. So we can go to the shell, and just as we have done many times before, create new roles in the database using SQL Alchemy commands in the shell. We also need to add these roles to the user object that we will be using to test Flask principle.
We should also add some code to our registration view in order to make sure that each user is initialized with the default role. Next, in the extensions.py file, initialize the principal object. As with Flask login, the principal object needs to be registered on the application object in the underscore init underscore dot py file. Next we can create the permission objects which will be attached to our user's identity when they log in. Let's start by importing permission object. We'll just have two different permissions in our app, one based on the admin role and one based on the default role. Normally, we would need to create our own need objects to represent the security which we want to define. Thankfully, Flask Principal has already created a need object that represents roles for the users. It is called the role need object. So import it because we are going to be using it to create our permission objects. So here is how you create the admin permission and the default permission. Flask Principal also provides the user need, which allows you to easily define that a specific user can only access certain view. It will not be used in our app to protect any of the views. The next step is to create a callback on the app object that executes every time the identity changes. Those who haven't used other languages other than Python that often may not be familiar with the concept of a callback as it is not used often in Python code. A callback is any function that is executed by another function after some process has completed. This is most commonly used as asynchronous code because some functions can only be run after the results of another are returned. This callback will be created in the underscore init underscore py file as it requires the app object to be initialized and does not provide an init underscore app method equivalent. This function will be called on identity loaded. But the name doesn't actually matter. What matters is the decorator on the function from Flask principle, which we have to pass the app object to. This designates the function as a callback for Flask principle. In this function, we have to add the permission object to the identity. The function has to accept two parameters the first being what object initiated the change in identity, in this case it would be the application object, and secondly the identity object, which we will attach the permission objects to. First set the user attribute of the identity to the current underscore user defined by Flask login. Next, we check if the object returned by current underscore user has the ID attribute, because it's possible for it not to be there if this is an anonymous user. And if it exists, define a permission for a user need on the identity via the provides add method. And then we do the same things for the roles attribute, which we loop over the list of roles and add a role need to the identity for each. Now the identity object has all the information it needs about our user. The next piece that we have to add is the method call in our login and logout views to signal that the identity has changed. This uses the identity underscore change method of Flask principle, so we need to import the identity underscore changed object. We also need to import the identity and the anonymous identity objects. After the user has been logged in with the login user function call, use the identity underscore changed dot send method with the first parameter as the current app object from the current underscore app proxy that Flask provides and keyword arguments called identity that passes a new identity object with the user's ID passed in to initialize it. This will tell Flask principle that a new user has logged in and will execute the function that we just created in the create app method. Now we move on to the logout view. It's the same function call, but instead of the identity object with the user ID, pass the anonymous identity object instead. Now we can add some code to one of our views to protect it from people without the right permissions. Let's go back to our fictional restricted view that we used in the last section and add the following decoration. What this does is, it says that to access this view, the identity of the current user must provide the admin underscore permission object. The keyword argument, HTTP underscore exception, tells Flask principle that, 
instead of an exception being thrown when the user does not have the admin underscore permission, the flask abort function should be called. In this case, the 403 code is used because it signifies that the user does not have permission to access the requested resource. The required decoration also works with the user need object. We can also combine permission checks in the view itself with the can method. If we wanted only people who had both the default and the admin roles, we can use both can methods in an if statement, and if the check fails, call the abort function. We now have a fully functioning login and permission system. Let's test it. It seems like I made a small typo. Let's fix it real quick. And now let's test our app again. It works! Let's go over what we learned in this section. In this section, we created a login system using Flask Login. We learned about password hashing and implemented all of the extra functionality that Flask Login needed. We also implemented a permission system using Flask Principle. To do this, we used a new role model that defined what the user can and cannot do. This gives us fine-grained control over what resources are accessible by what users. So that's the end of this section. In the next section, we'll create a REST API, which will allow outside users to access our data from a machine-friendly interface.